Talk 106 to 108. Now, as a veteran broadcaster and producer who spent over 40 years on our radios and television screens, there's no doubt that uh, my next guest has some interesting stories to share about his career. And with his stage show, Sorry, We're Off the Air, uh, coming to the National Concert Hall on September the 6th, Brendan Balfe is bringing these backstage anecdotes to an audience, uh, and probably an audience who will find the whole thing very exotic and uh, almost and ancient history. Yeah. And also hilarious, is the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, well true. I, I, I did a, a lunch a couple of years ago for a yacht club, um, for a, a charity thing, and it was based on the anecdotes. And it went down so well, they, they, they said they haven't laughed so much in a long time. I said, maybe there's money in this. <laughs> I thought to myself, as a sort of semi, uh, semi-retired broadcaster, so it's, it's in the concert hall on uh, Tuesday week, and it's uh, hopefully doing very well. Now, how did you get into to broadcasting? Because you were the youngest ever announcer on I Radio was, Air. I was, yeah. Uh, before that, I'd done a program, a, a, a straightforward record program called Then and Now. The signature tune of which, by the way, uh, for a prophetic line, was this could be the start of something big, <laughs> on purpose. Uh, and I did that. Then I became a, a relief announcer when I was working in insurance. You have to work in insurance or the bank, as you know, to be, to be in radio. And then I just, the, the, my original... original entry was writing a letter. I was cheesed off writing to the banks and writing to insurance companies. I wrote to Kevin Roach, who was the head of music, and I said, pretty much, I'm God's gift to radio, and if you play your cards right, I may do an audition, but I would hurry if I were you. <laughs> and they more or less said, OK, smarty fans, come in, and that's really how it happened. And that's how it happened. Now, y- you were a freelance for a long time, eventually on staff on RT, but as a freelance, you could do other things. You could do sponsored Very programs. And, uh, you were a producer, a writer... Many things. Yeah, a bit of everything. Well, whatever, whatever paid the bills, essentially. Um, the sponsored programs, I, I started off doing a program with Gabo called the Ernie Mystery Parcel, which is a, a thing where people send in things like sheep's heads and toenails and things. I would play a record to match it. The sheep's head gave us um, I'll Never Find Another You, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. That, that's what I was, and then I, I, I was you, doing... I, you, there's nothing new under the sun. Can we have that? Can we <laughs> use that on this program? <laughs> so, so we, I was doing sponsor programs and then I became a staff announcer then I became I resigned in in, in, uh, in 68 because they wouldn't let me work for the BBC I was doing roundabout on BBC uh, Radio 2 but they said any, any more of these you have to take leave and, and I said well enough because there's enough happening in the freelance world at the time because you do um, not only announcing bits but also things like pop call and the top ten and all these yokes that were around Yeah, but you, you made an income from bits and pieces and, and very much so very very much so I, I was always and I, looking back it's, it's, it's miraculous how I actually you know raised a house raised a family educated two kids I can't I don't know how it was done but it was done now Terry Terry Wogan was there when you joined. Yes, he, he was the senior announcer, and he was uh, he was uh, mischievous to put it mildly. And, and uh, I remember he trained me, uh, and he more or less contradicted what everyone else said. You know, he he even then it was a sense of fun. And also uh, himself and Dennis Meehan, our, our great comrade and our great friend from the time who was the head of the section, always said, you know, you must trust the listener and you must assume that they're bright. And I've, I've never forgotten that. Um, yeah. Don't talk down to them. Assume they've got a brain and start there. And that's what I did. But Wogan always also meant that having a brain means you can also have a bit of fun. So he used to, when I, on my very, very, very first announcement, when I was doing the Maury Eva Majin at Ian Ushla, he poured a water, jug of water over my head to see if I, if I would break down. And I didn't quite break down but I kept on going and I remember following that and this is a slightly rude word coming up but I, I was reading the cattle market report which was the announcer's duty at the time and my first time he came in with me and said oh no I, we're going on in 10 seconds stand by 5 seconds go on the red line remember it's and it's fat bullocks not fat bollocks off you go <laughs> and uh, so pretty much uh, you're trying to remember what, what, what is it I'm not to say you know <laughs> now uh, Riverdance of course was a television phenomenon became a stage show but it, like, it's not the first time that dancing was a media phenomenon. No, it wasn't. Um, it's now called, believe it or not, body percussion. Did you know that? that I did not. It is now. And it started when the BBC noted, did I hear dancing on Irish radio? <laughs> Gentlemen, we hope you enjoy the show and that you'll join us again. In the meantime, let's cheer you up and 
Michael O'Neill, Francis McDermott, the Broadsiders, Dennis Brennan, Maura Sullivan, Father Fenton, Albert Healy, the Rory O'Connor Dancers, the Gallo Daskaley Band. Our two sound men, John Eames and Harry Bradshaw, producer John Lynch, and yours as always, Dinjo. <laughs> Dancing on the radio. I'm nothing wrong with it. Why why wouldn't? Funnily enough, I I found out since that that the even Kaylee bands not broadcasting used to hire a dancer to keep time before they put a drum kit in. So actually, that was the reason for it. Apparently, now um, you started off on the GPO, which Mm. was um, decrepit. Uh, I mean, it was a a place that was past its best. Yeah, brown and cream paints and uh, and and tiles along the long hundred mile hundred yard corridor, the longest row of lavatories in the world. Or someone call it, uh, and I was there was a slightly decrepit, and we were there. I, I just checked the dates. We were there. I mean, I, I do remember putting you on the air there. You did stage. absolutely. My first announcement. Well, you were standing over my shoulder. You didn't pour water on me then. Yes, but I do remember it. I think I had to say the time is a quarter to two. Yes, I have never been more nervous about anything <laughs> in my life. Well, I just walked away and said, "Either you you say it or no, it won't get said." Pretty much. <laughs> that, that was it. Where, where was that? It was the sixties, nineteen seventy-two. I think was it around, around, around that time. Yeah. Good lord. Yeah. So it was a great place. It was much more like a, I think, than a, a local station, than a national station. It was a much more sense of, of repartee and eccentrics and people who shouldn't be let near a radio set. Uh, and it was just a lovely place to be. I remember, uh, the, I see a piece we have here. One of the last things that came out of there was Trasa Davison's famous announcement. We, we left eventually in 1976 going to Montrose and the continuity, the announcing session was the last to go because they were the, the pivotal uh, fulcrum of the whole thing and to hurry it along, um, Trasa Davison uh, thought she saw something. That was a stereophonic broadcast. Now the time is 8 o'clock and here the... <sighs> oh, I'm, I beg your pardon, I'm terribly sorry. Now the time is, uh, I better apologise, it's just the fact that a mouse ran across my desk. Um, here are now at 8 o'clock are the news headlines from um, from Don Coburn. And that was the mouse real or imagined? Well, she was an actress. Mm. She was an, has acted, acted in the Tyburn and Galway and was was good at uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, funnily enough, uh, the same trust who joined us later, because, I mean, she would have been older than me, but I, I was her senior in, in rank, if you like, and I was the station supervisor one night, and she was the, the announcer on probation almost. And I went down to her to say that. I just got a phone call that the Athlone transmitter has been off the air for the last half hour. Would you make an, an apology at the next gap? Now, either she picked it up wrong or I told her badly. But nonetheless, what she said was, uh, if you're listening to us on the Athlone transmitter, I'm sorry we're off the air. <laughs> so that's where I got my title from, the sorry we're off the air for the, for the station. About the, the, the mouse thing, I mean, it, there were mice because I remember I was doing an, an evening shift and I used to bring with me the aforementioned uh, batch loaf cheese sandwich with a mustard uh, wrapped in in silver wrap and I turned round about start of the symphony concert turned round to eat my sandwich and there was a a bit missing Oh, where the mouse had actually made his dinner out oh, of dear, my dear. sandwich. Well, that's a bit so that, that that was real. Yeah. Um, two FM, you were involved in the very beginnings. Yes, uh, yes. Um, and funnily enough, I was also the equity shop steward the night before, vowing not to open at all because we didn't <laughs> get the rights right. We were looking for increases for self-operational things. Uh, so um, yeah, I hope I was the first. I, I'm actually, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm actually uh, an answer in trivial pursuit. Really? The question is, who is the first voice on Radio 2? And it was yours truly, as we can this prove. This is RTE Radio 2. It's 23 minutes to 1 o'clock. And to present Pop Around Ireland, here is Larry Gogan. Thank you very much indeed, Brendan. And welcome to the first show on Radio 2. Stereo sounds on VHF. Um, what that's VHF? before the days of FM. Dad, yeah, exactly. Very high frequency. There's a sort of another another bookend to that. I just realised when we he- heard that there that uh, that was what, 79, May yeah. 1979. And about 30 years later, I did the last uh, programme on medium wave for Radio 1. So I'm very proud to say I opened to FM and closed, <laughs> ra- closed Radio 1. <laughs> I want to play uh, just uh, some sponsored stuff that you've brought in, Brendan, Bre- mm. and then you can d- tell us a little bit about it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Irish Hospital Sweepstakes Programme for your entertainment. And remember, ask your closer for Chiffers Jams. 
They're made by particular people for particular people. A cleaning and a pressing and a dying for you. We keep a cleaning and a pressing till we make it like new. Just let him go and go. Clean and press it for you. This is Frankie Byrne with another edition of Woman's Page, a program for and maybe about you. Now, the problems I'll be discussing today may not be yours, but they could be someday. Ask for Bird's Jelly Deluxe. Well, after all, you do want the best, don't you? And Walter's last word is the same as it has been for nearly 30 years. If you feel like singing, do sing an Irish song. Extraordinary. I mean, I didn't like some of them. I didn't particularly like the Waltons program with no. Charlie McGee and his great gay guitar. Yes, yeah. Uh, but they are vignettes, aren't they? Totally. And it's amazing when people um, remember old radio or 50s radio, 60s radio, it's the sponsored programs they tend to remember, believe it or not, because they were the, the ones that made such an impression. Were, I mean, they were half the day's transmission, the morning, lunchtime, and some of the evening it was sponsored programs. So, which was essentially the beginning of commercial radio. It was the production uh, sector for commercial radio because they were mostly recorded out of the studios in, in, in commercial studios and the occasional live ones had a, a sponsor programme yeah. suite and them. they were slick compared to <laughs> they were and a bit loud yeah. and, 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 and as Jimmy McGee once said that they were difficult because you had to do three, you had three audiences to please the, the radio audience first of all the sponsored audience you know, there's the person playing for it and Raddy Ryan himself who said well we don't like the look of that we're not playing that so, so there was always a, it did sharpen your wits about, about uh, dealing with, with, a, with an audience and the audience is an audience of one by and large isn't that that's it? That's it. That's the great, um, the great anomaly that you're, they're listening in millions, but they're listening in ones, essentially. And people rarely crowd around the radio set anymore, you'll notice. Yeah. So we are talking to the listener. Absolutely. Which Wogan always said, even if the sign off, he said, thank you, listener, for being my friend. That was his last word, yeah. Well, Brendan, I'm looking forward to your show. Sorry we're off the air. It's on in the National Concert Hall in the John Field Room on uh, September the 6th and booking from the National Concert Hall. Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, cheap. <laughs> well worth the money. And hilarious, by the way. It's, it's a very funny show, I'm told, uh, I, I think. It's well, true to say. You can actually hear them and see them rocking in the aisles. Brendan <laughs> Bow, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat.